So uh, when it comes to management of diabetes, following the diagnosis of uh, type 2 diabetes mainly, our aim is to have a good, uh, you, you know, reduce the mortality and morbidity and improve the quality of life of our patients who are having type 2 diabetes. But during this process, we know that there are a lot of issues uh, happening to these individuals. Namely, they can have cardiovascular disease, renal issues, neuropathies, complications of diabetes mellitus. So our aim is to reduce these complications and give our patients a quality life with reduced mortality and morbidity. In doing so, all these years, we have been following few principles in managing type 2 diabetes. I would not go in detail into detail of those. One uh, principle was early type blood glucose control reduces microvascular complications. And the other one was early type blood glucose control reduces macrovascular complications. So we aim to control the blood sugars very early and to a very tight level in our patients. And then when doing so, we have defined individualized HbA1c targets so that we know how tight we should be controlling our patient's blood glucose levels. And we have used several anti-diabetic medications to achieve our glycemic targets. And finally, because all our patients have a lot of other NCDs which would contribute to uh, increasing in mortality and morbidity like hypertension, dyslipidemia, uh, obesity, and smoking, we have been uh, trying to control the other risk factors while managing the glycemic levels. So those have been our principles of management in type 2 diabetes for a very long time. By doing so, are we reaching the targets? Now, if you see uh, one third of our patients, uh, this is worldwide data, uh, had been had suffering from diabetic retinopathy and visual loss. There's a two to three times increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And there are so many uh, patients uh, having amputations, like every 30 seconds, a lower limb is lost or due to amputation following complications of diabetes. Therefore, are we really doing well while following the principles that I have told? Uh, how about the data abroad? Now, this is UK data uh, regarding control of HbA1c, control of blood pressure and cholesterol. Only 43% has achieved the targets. This is in UK, not in Sri Lanka. And how about our own uh, data? This is uh, um, data from uh, one of the national uh, diabetes clinics. So in that um, clinic, 13% of the patients had macrovascular disease. About 74% of the diabetic patients suffered from microvascular complications. So have we been doing well so far? With that background, I would go through a few topics in my talk regarding cardiorenal protection in type 2 diabetes weight reduction as a new um, strategy and technologies in diabetes as well as reversal and prevention of diabetes. If you take mortality and morbidity, you may see that sudden cardiac deaths, acute MI and heart failures would account for majority of the cardiovascular deaths. About 66% are due to cardiovascular deaths in our patients with diabetes, whereas only 33% are due to non-cardiovascular deaths. Therefore, this cardiovascular health is very important in our patients. So up to now, what we have been doing was we had been controlling the sugars uh, because high blood glucose levels would affect the heart as well as the kidneys and increase the cardiovascular and renal mortality, leading to cardiovascular and renal deaths as well as non-cardiovascular deaths. So this is the sequel that we thought high sugars, in, uh, increased morbidity in cardiovascular system and renal and then deaths. So what we have been trying to do was to reduce the sugar levels, thinking this will reduce cardiovascular disease and this will reduce cardiovascular deaths. 
we have a lot of evidence to think like that coming from a lot of uh, studies or CTs and uh, we have been doing that. But as I showed you, we were not really successful in reducing cardiovascular deaths still. Then people thought, okay, can, apart from going through this line, can certain medications straightly or directly reduce the cardiovascular diseases or events apart from controlling the sugar levels? Whether they can affect this in-between level directly or they can whether can they directly reduce the cardiovascular deaths rather than going through the same events like I pre previously mentioned. Maybe in addition to going through the sugar controlling effects, can they directly reduce the cardiovascular deaths? So in search of this question, they have found several medications which are capable of doing this effect in addition to reducing the glucose uh, levels. So SGLT2 inhibitors, this is in the market widely now, and actually it is not new, although I call it new era. Uh, this is all of you know about SGLT2 inhibitors, namely empagliflozin, dapagliflozin, canagliflozin. For the, for the medical students' knowledge, I will just summarize what it is. Usually the glomerulus filters glucose, and they will be reabsorbed in our proximal convoluting tubule back to the blood system. Therefore, there will not be any glucose urea in our urine. There will not be glucose in a healthy person. But uh, in uh, diabetic patients, now this uh, the, the sugar levels are high and the rate of absorption is also high. Therefore, high sugar levels which are filtered will again be reabsorbed to the blood glucose, blood uh, bloodstream. What if we block this receptor, which is the SGLT2 uh, transporter, which transports glucose back into the blood? If we block this receptor, what will happen is most of the filtered glucose will pass through urine and only very few will be reabsorbed into the bloodstream. Therefore, although the patient has diabetes, most of the sugar levels will be passing through the urine and will not be reabsorbed into the blood through the glomerulus. Therefore, blood sugars will be controlled. So that is the mechanism of SGLT2 inhibitors. So one might expect more urinary tract infections in this scenario because they have a lot of sugars in urine. And when it comes to SGLT2 inhibitors, there are landmark trials. I would not go into them. But you can see the cardiovascular deaths have been reduced compared to the placebo in patients who have been using SGLT2 inhibitors, so as hospitalization for heart failure in many studies. You can see this uh, graph, and uh, it shows uh, patients uh, with cardiovascular events in encourage outcome trial, cumulative cardiovascular deaths. Compared to the placebo, you can see the empagliflozin group has reduced cardiovascular deaths. And again, how about renal outcome? You can see overall renal outcome measured by use of risk of dialysis, transplantation, and death due to kidney disease in individuals with type 2 diabetes have been significantly reduced in the group where they have used SGLT2 inhibitors compared to the placebo. Again, more data, composite outcome of renal disease progression into end-stage renal failure and end-stage renal failure uh, re needing re uh, renal replacement treatment as well as renal death had been reduced by 40 to 60% in this group who had used SGLT2 inhibitors. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, SGLT2 inhibitors have uh, markedly improved the cardiovascular outcome as well as renal outcome in this cohort of patients who had been using them, they are, who are having type 2 diabetes. So it reduces sugars as well as it has improved the cardiovascular and renal outcome. Now, to see that our cardiologists and the nephrologist use these medications even in patients who do not have type 2 diabetes because it has a lot of protective effects on heart failure and kidney disease um, 
that uh, we had not seen in any other medications before this era. Okay, switching gears, I'll move on to something called GLP-1 analogs. This is another uh, medication that uh, in the market in Sri Lanka, uh, not very abundantly due to its cost, but it is available in the private sector. Now, what happens when we take food? In our gut, a small, in the small intestine, some uh, incretin, a polypeptide named GLP-1 will be released. This will increase the insulin secretion through our pancreatic beta cells, so as it reduces the glucagon level. So there will be more insulin when they have this GLP-1 uh, incretin. What happens in patients with type 2 diabetes, it was shown that this GLP-1 amount is reduced in type 2 diabetes, patients with type 2 diabetes. And what does this GLP-1 do? Apart from uh, increasing insulin levels, it reduces the appetite as well as it reduces the gastric emptying, which where the patient will feel full with little amount of food and then they will not eat more and more. So in our patients with type 2 diabetes, this GLP-1 if it is less, therefore they would not get this increased insulin secretion as well as they don't get this satiety. What we have been trying to do is to give this GLP-1 externally so that our patients will have higher GLP-1 uh, levels so that there will be more insulin secretion and reduce appetite. There are a lot of injections, once daily, once weekly, and now there's an oral tablet also, semaglutide, uh, in this group called GLP-1 analogs. And will they, obviously they will reduce the sugars because insulin will be increased. Will they affect the cardiovascular outcome? So these trials have shown, um, compared with the placebo, they have shown the major adverse cardiovascular events and all these trials have favored the use of GLP-1 agonists saying that people who use them will have less cardiovascular events. Again, cumulative incidence of death from cardiovascular causes. This study leader trial has shown use of GLP-1 analogs have reduced the cardiovascular deaths compared to those who don't use. Again, what about renal outcome? The re exploratory renal composite outcome has reduced in patients who use this uh, medication. And also those uh, in them, the macroalbuminuria has also uh, reduced compared to those who do not use uh, GLP-1 analogs. You can see in leader trial as well as sustain trial, the same effects. And another trial about renal outcomes, in those who used these uh, GLP-1 agonists they are indicated in red line, you can see that uh, the composite renal outcome has been reduced as well as new macroalbuminuria had been reduced compared to the use of placebo. And all these changes are statistically significant. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, now we have two medications, namely SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists, who will affect the cardiovascular and renal systems directly, as well as reduce the cardiovascular deaths directly, in addition to going through the pathway of glucose reduction, resulting in reduction of both these uh, more cardiovascular events, as well as cardiovascular deaths. So I've discussed about cardiorenal protection in diabetes, and uh, this has actually uh, changed a lot of things in the practice of type, type 2 diabetes. And as in the guidelines, now these agents have come, uh, come into the second place after metformin. Uh, it probably would take the first place in the years to come. Those who have cardiovascular and renal disease will get this medication before the second line agent. Uh, or maybe in the future, it would take the first place replacing metformin. Okay, I will uh, now talk a little bit on weight reduction. You know that some of the medications have uh, used in diabetes have been uh, used for weight reduction, namely metformin in old 
good old days, but metformin effect for weight reduction is very transient. It would not cause a permanent weight reduction. But uh, although it is not very clear, you know, all these are anti-diabetic medications. Most of them belong to the groups that I have discussed, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 analogs. They have caused about one to four kilograms weight loss using different mechanisms. And uh, in our patients who are being treated for diabetes, if you use SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 analogs, you may experience a weight reduction effect. And there is a new uh, drug which I will discuss shortly. Now, I'll, I discussed about GLP-1 analogs, the injections that I talked a little while ago. So what they do is they increase the satiety that is direct action through the uh, brain as well as it reduces the gastric empty. So the patient feels full and it increases insulin secretion and reduces glucagon. So the glucose will be handled well uh, and it initiates nausea. So our patients would not eat much. All these mechanisms will reduce body weight as well as reduce blood glucose levels. While talking GL about GLP-1 analogs, there is a twin effect by another molecule called GIP. Now, GIP, again, is secreted following a meal through our intestine, and it affects, it causes more or less the same effects by increasing increases, uh, causing increased satiety and reduced gastric acid secretion and emptying and so on, will enhance the action of GLP-1 and causes the same effects. And the, we call this dual incretin effect or twin cretin because both are incretins which act similarly. And by considering that combination of GLP-1 and GIP, uh, the Western world have uh, produced a molecule called, a drug called terzabatide, which is now a new hot topic in the diabetes field which will affect the brain to reduce appetite and reduce food intake, which will affect the pancreas to increase the insulin secretion and uh, increases the insulin synthesis as well as beta cell survival that will look after the blood glucose levels. And it also will affect the white adipose tissues to increase lipolysis and uh, increase the lipogenesis as well as avoid ectopic fat deposition. All in all, they will cause significant sugar level reduction as well as weight loss. Look at these graphs. Now, this is the HbA1c, the glycemic control of these medications over a placebo. You can see terzabatide has caused significant HbA1c reduction, so as weight reduction compared to the placebo, which is statistically significant. But it was not uh, shown to give major cardiovascular outcome results by using this medication. However, now uh, we talked about GLP-1 agonists like semaglutide. What if we, what is the difference between this and semaglutide? So semaglutide has, is a GLP-1 agonist. Terzabatide is GLP-1 plus GLP, the twin effect. So uh, in addition to GLP-1, this group has more an additional molecule, GIP. So if we compare those, the twin creatines or terzabatide has more um, uh, significant HbA1c reduction compared to semaglutide, so as significant weight loss compared to semaglutide. So it is superior to GLP-1 agonist alone causing sugar control as well as weight loss. So we have new medications like SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1, and now the new medication terzabatide, that is the combination of GLP-1 and GIP for our weight reduction. And we'll come to why weight reduction is important in our next slides. I'll move on to the diabetes uh, reversal and prevention. Now, all of us know about type 2 diabetes can be prevented by means of extensive lifestyle modifications and um, uh, significant weight loss. So, can if somebody gets the type 2 diabetes and if somebody is suffering from type 2 diabetes maybe for a couple of years, 
can this diabetes be cured? That is the very first question the patients come and ask. Mage diabetes on the karana pulwande. They might have the Can we answer that question? Now, nowadays we call reversal or preferably the word is remission of type 2 diabetes. This is an interesting study uh, which was uh, designed at the primary care uh, setup in uh, United States. That is the normal general practitioners, day-to-day -day doctors who would see no patients at their primary care setting have done this trial, had got involved. So you and I can do this if we think it's possible. Right? So they have included diabetic patients, type 2 diabetes, within six years of diagnosis, age 20 to 66 years, with a BMI of 27 to 45, that is the overweight obese group. And in the primary care setup, what they have done is uh, they have randomized this uh, group into a placebo and treatment arm. In the treatment arm, these patients were put on a very like low calorie diet uh, with a diet replacement containing about 830 kilocalories per day. That is for about three to five months. And so they have received very low calorie, kind of a low calorie diet, right? And uh, then following that period, they have reintroduced gradually, the gradual fruit reintroduction had been done and weight maintenance up to 52 weeks. Now, after the outcome was, uh, they have expected about more than 15 kilograms weight loss in these obese patients. And diabetes remission was defined as HbA1c less than 6.5% without oral medications for two months duration. So this is the design. And what have they seen? At 12 months, they have seen in this group, only 24% have achieved 15 kilograms weight loss. But look at this. Nearly 50% have gone into diabetes remission. So their diabetes was cured. Or, although I say cured, it was kind of, it went back to the normal sugar levels without medications. So patients would say, okay, magadiyavadiya hondhuna. Right? Okay. And uh, about 74% had significant number of drug discontinuation. So medications have been reduced or taken off. And this was done in the primary care setup. So uh, type 2 diabetic patients up to 6 years duration can be reversed by weight loss with help of evidence-based structured weight management program delivered in a community setting by routine primary care staff. So you and I if we put our effort, can make significant amount of our patients go into remission rather than just continuing drugs. Now, after this study, they have rechecked about what happens to these patients at 24 months. What I showed was 12 month results. Now, at 24 months, again, although it was initially 46%, 36% has remained in remission of diabetes which is a significant amount, but you may appreciate a significant uh, number of patients had lost the control as well. So the persistence of this uh, intervention needs to be uh, considered as well. So at 24 months, the conclusion had been type 2 diabetes is not necessarily a, a lifelong condition. It, is, it can be go, uh, sent into a remission period with weight loss. And uh, weight loss is challenging, maintenance of weight loss, and more than 10 kilogram weight loss achieved by one fourth of interventional group in this study. And ongoing support and relapse management uh, will re limit weight regain. So ongoing support is needed for these patients. Okay, now is it possible in real world without any intervention? Well, it's very, uh, it's not very frequent the patients go into remission in real world without a significant uh, intervention. Only 9.7 per thousand person years will go into remission otherwise. So we need an active program for our patients to make it go from diabetes to diabetes remission so that they can enjoy life while maintaining weight. Now, I've talked about the obese group. What about the lean group? 
can the can a person with less than 27 bmi who has diabetes go into a remission we can't may well 15 kilograms weight loss may not be possible in this group but if you aim about 5% weight loss from the baseline there could be a significant uh, rate of remission in this group also about uh, 8 per 12 people in this study has gone into remission by 5% weight loss in this relatively lead group. Okay, now we have uh, discussed about medications causing weight loss and uh, dietary interventions causing weight loss going into remission. How about bariatric surgery? We do quite a number of bariatric surgeries, especially in the Western province. Now, um, bariatric surgery is another method where the re diabetes remission has been observed. You know, bariatric surgery is removing part of your stomach or making different um, mini gastric bypasses or rule and my uh, bypasses in the gut so that the absorption of nutrients will be limited and that will cause weight loss. Can it cause remission? Yes, this has shown that uh, compared to the conventionally managed group, the bariatric surgical group has a significant diabetes remission about 65% in observational studies. Even in randomized control studies, it was proven that bariatric surgery can cause diabetes remission. The mechanism, it is actually before the um, weight loss has begun, the remission occurs. Suggested mechanisms are in creatine effect like GLP-1, GIP changes, and insulin secretory changes, and sens hepatic sensitivity changes. We don't know why it is, but even before weight loss, they can go into diabetes remission in bariatric surgery. Is it a reality in Sri Lanka? Yes. Uh, this is a, actually a very preliminary study group, um, but it is possible with bariatric surgery for a significant weight loss. You can see the changes in our patient. And what about diabetes? In this small cohort, you can see out of the diabetic patients, they have gone like 61% in these Sri Lankan people have gone into complete remission of diabetes and partial remission about 31%. What about pre-diabetes? Those who had pre-diabetes, 71% had gone into complete normalization of glucose levels and 29% has shown improvement of glycemic levels. And although that was a very small group, now this is the current data published from the Columbus South group. Uh, one year remission rate had been 87% in our Sri Lankan population following bariatric surgery. And at five years, it maintained at around 74% of diabetes remission. So all these patients, all these 94 and 41 patients, about like 130 patients had diabetes and high weight. And after five years, they had lost weight and have no diabetes not on medications. Okay, so that's about diabetes remission in type two diabetes. Uh, I've initially talked about preventing type two diabetes. We know that we can do lifestyle modifications and prevent type two diabetes because it's kind of a uh, lifestyle related uh, diabetes. Now, what about type one diabetes? Type one diabetes, we know it is autoimmune driven. And then there's no way of preventing, as far as I know, we knew. Uh, now, but looking at the mechanism of this autoimmunity, now we can think of preventing type 1 diabetes. How, to, how can we do? Now, these study groups have, now, have, uh, now let's talk about the pathophysiology. Now, beta cells uh, will, uh, the particles, certain um, proteinous particles will be presented to these antigen presenting cells and they will communicate with these effector T cells through CD3 um, receptors and these T cells will go to beta cells and destroy the beta cells. In this process, get several antibodies like GET antibodies will be produced. We take them as a marker in type 1 diabetes. Now, what this group has done is they have taken patients 
who are get positive, that is relatives of type 1 diabetes who are get positive, which means they have autoimmunity in their body, but still they don't have diabetes. So relatives of type 1 diabetic patients who have get antibodies, but yet with normal sugar levels, which means they will develop type 1 diabetes in the future. They have taken this group and given anti-CD3 monoclonal antibodies. So they will block this process of autoimmunity and destruction of beta cells. And look at the graph. The red cells, the red line indicates the use of drug and the blue line indicates these group with get positivity but no diabetes without any intervention. Now C-peptide levels have markedly reduced by 20 months of this control group and in comparison you can see the in those who we use this drug have relatively preserved C peptide or insulin levels. So and in other words, by about 60 weeks, you can see the type 1 diabetes free interval in this column. So you can see in red line where the placebo arm is read in this graph. So they have only very few number has been able to survive without getting diabetes by 60 months. Whereas comparatively higher number of patients or relatives who are at risk of type 1 diabetes have survived without getting type 1 diabetes in the treatment arm. So in conclusion, this medication, teplizumab, has delayed the progression of clinical type 1 diabetes in high-risk participants. So we have hope of preventing type 1 diabetes in this group. Okay, so finally, I will touch a little bit about technologies in diabetes management, which is coming up and in Western world, it is the revolution of type 1 and again type 2 diabetes management and continuous glucose monitoring. How do we monitor our diabetic patients? That's by fasting PPBS values or SMBG, that is self-monitoring of blood glucose using blood glucose strips once a month or once a week or maybe a couple of times a day. But continuous glucose monitoring is now a day, nowadays the method of monitoring glycemic levels. That is a sensor placed in the subcutaneous tissue and a small gadget applied into the skin. They will sense the real-time glucose levels in your body. So from for every five seconds, you will get the data and produces a graph like this. You can see the patterns of glucose every day given a different color and how the glucose levels fluctuate every five seconds without you pricking your finger every five seconds. Uh, yeah, and what is the use of it? Well, you can, since you get a glucose reading, you may detect the undetected hypos in our patients or hypers in our patients. And when the patients get these, you can intervene. So you see what's happening in a patient as a film of glucose changes rather than a photo of glucose values that we see in our setup. Another user-friendly way is flash glucose monitoring, a patch applied to your uh, arm and uh, earlier days, uh, the app or the sensor, we used to swap across the sensor every now and then, and then we would get a reading. Nowadays, the technology has improved even without swapping. If the reader or the app or the, your uh, smartphone, if it is nearby uh, through Bluetooth mechanisms, uh, they will send the, the blood glucose readings. What you get is the value at that time plus the trend. You can see the upward row. So if your blood glucose is rising, you see the row going up. If your blood glucose will drop within the next 10 or 15 minutes, it will show the drop row. And now the sensors are advanced so that they will give low blood glucose level alarms as well as high blood glucose level alarms. So it will alarm telling, okay, you are going to get low sugars in another 10 to 15 minutes. So that's very game changing for our patients. They will have the control of their blood glucose levels. You can see a lot of people, this is previous uh, prime minister in UK, Theresa May, 
She's a type 1 diabetic patient using a flash glucose meter. So it's, uh, it has become a very much a game changer for our patients living with diabetes, especially type 1. And nowadays, even type 2 diabetic patients are also using. Okay, how do we monitor? Now, this use of CGM has brought the new concept of time in range concept. That is how much of percentage time that our patient is within the normal range. Now, in future, in a couple of years' time, we will replace the use of fasting blood sugar, if we get the technology, of course, fasting blood sugar, HbA1c, into time in range. So we will be talking, okay, my patient's time in range is about 56%. So you need to know what does that mean. Time in range means do you, within the given range, how much of time the patient has spent during their day or during the given period of time. So if we take 70%, that is 70% of the, our patient has spent the sugar, his sugar levels were in the desired uh, range that, the, we, that we have defined. Let's say 130, so 80 to 130, 70% of the time patient's blood glucose was within that range. That's what we call time in range. And we call time below range and time above range as well. I will not go into detail, uh, but let's take HbA1c and time in range. Now, if you take the, above, the graphs here, there's much fluctuation of these glucose. First graph, second graph, but the third graph shows a perfect blood glucose levels within the range. But if you take the average, like we take in HbA1c, all these three patients, average blood glucose level is 154 milligrams per deciliter or HbA1c is 7. So we, when we see HbA1c of 7, we say, okay, perfect. Your sugar is on, like, you know, in our target. Good. We'll repeat the same medications. But to see what happens in this patient, there will be lows as well as ups. There is much glycemic fluctuation in our patient. Number two patient has less fluctuation, but still has highs and some lows. But third one is perfect. We have no way of checking this, identifying this, unless we do the time in range. So you see, third one has 100% time in range, whereas the first one has only 40% time in range, 40% above range, and 20% below range. So that's the use of time in range, and this will come in the future. And uh, actually, this is important to know because some of our patients are on flash glucose monitors and CGMs. Uh, they breed from abroad and they come to you with the reader or your app. So you should be able to identify, okay, this is actually what it is, right? We can't say, okay, we don't have it, so we don't know. We need to know. Has this CGMs improved the glycemic levels? Yes. During this period one, they have used CGMs and you can see the HbA1c drop. At this point, they have removed the CGM and rechecked. You can see without the CGM, the HbA1c has all again uh, raised. Why? CGM shows our patient the sugar levels. So they will be more careful in what they eat and what they do. Okay, moving from uh, CGMs, the next thing is insulin pumps. I'm sure you must have heard. This is an insulin pump, especially in type, two, type 1 diabetic patients. Rather than injecting four times a day, this pump delivers insulin according to the instructions given previously. And that has advanced into artificial pancreas, so closed loop or hybrid closed loop insulin delivery systems. Nowadays, uh, the Western world is switching from pen injections into the hybrid closed loop uh, insulin delivery. What happens is a CGM, continuous glucose monitoring device, detects the sugar levels in the body, and that will communicate with the pump. Okay, it says, okay, look here, now the sugars are high, deliver some insulin more than what it is. So the pump delivers more insulin. And when the sugars are low, this detects the sh low sugar levels and tells the pump, look, now sugars are getting low, don't deliver many much insulin. So pump will reduce the amount of insulin delivered to the body. So this is an artificial pancreas-like thing, which will detect the sugar levels and accordingly deliver the insulin uh, corresponding to the algorithm which was feeded to this system beforehand. 
Okay, lastly, I let's say a transplant in type 1 diabetes. Again, it's not new, but still we don't have it in Sri Lanka. What we do is uh, we extract pancreatic islet cell from a donor and then inject into the recipient's uh, portal system and they will get implanted in the portal system and we do it for type 1 diabetes. So rather than pancreatic transplant, we go for islet cell transplant because that is what is deficient in type 1. Uh, you can see that following the islet cell transplant, 24-hour blood glucose level uh, has, um, has come down gradually, as well as glycemic variability has come down. And insulin requirement in this uh, right upper graph has come down. And time in range shown by the last graph has gone up. So more time in range has happened in these patients with uh, islet cell transplant. There are issues, but uh, this is again an option. So I have talked about the cardiorenal protection in this era, which is a different strategy from what we learned in our medical stu students' uh, time. Weight reduction in relation to diabetic medications, remission and prevention of type di of diabetes, both type one and type two, and technologies in diabetes. Why do we need all these? Because a significant number of Sri Lankan population do have diabetes. So earlier we thought it's 7 to 10% and later on 8 to 15%, but actually it is above 20%. So one in fifth, one, one in five patients or sorry, one in five individuals or one in four individuals of our population do have diabetes. Pre-diabetes group is much more. Therefore, we need to do differently in our management of type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes. So it's important to know what it is in the horizon so that we can do things differently than what we do now. Thank you very much.